Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Twit Specials is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. Equal Parts Art Show, Engineering Conference, Summer Camp, and Burning Man. And what do you get? I'm Father Robert Bellisair, and this is Maker Fair. For fans of Battlestar Galactica, there's probably nothing more exciting than being able to actually fly a Viper. That's why I'm here at Team Viper at Maker with Alex. Alex, thank you very much for talking to us. Good to talk now, to you. You built a Viper. What's that about? Why would you do that? Well, we decided to build a uh, flight simulator themed after Battlestar Galactica um, because uh, my friend Sam over here, he was at the uh, Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C., and they went on a, uh, like a flight simulator ride. And it was only, uh, it rolled 360 in one direction, but it only could pitch about 20 degrees, plus or minus, on the pitch. So we decided, hey, we could probably do that a little bit better. We could do 360 on both axes. The Smithsonian model wasn't enough for you, so you decided to one-up up, one up them with another axis of freedom. Exactly. Okay. Now tell me a little bit about this. I know it's created from a Piper co cockpit that you've carved up, but what drives it? What, what actually allows the pilot to, to control it and make it fly like a Viper and then have, in real life, the cockpit tilt and roll? Yeah. So we have uh, two one-horsepower motors, electric motors, that are hooked up to uh, Basically, our basically an Arduino, and the Arduino tells it uh, we got we got position data from the virtual game called Diaspora, which is the, the which is a modded uh, Free Space Two game that's themed exactly like Battlestar. So you're actually flying you're flying the Theseus, and then you get into a Viper and you go through the launch, do the whole thing. It's it's really cool. And then once you're in the air, the 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 virtual cockpit sends data to the ground the ground station, and the ground station relays that to an Arduino. The Arduino tells the motors where it needs to be and how far it needs to go, and it servos the entire platform, giving power to the motors, and then matches the orientation of the platform to the orientation in games. Alex, thank you very much, and uh, we'll see you next year, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Experience makers know that you have to play the part if you're gonna be at the fair, but something's missing. Electric cars are all the rage. We want them. We want more of them. We want them to be fast. We want them to be beautiful. But what happens if you don't want an off-the-assembly-line car? You want something a bit more you, more customized. That's why we're here at eMotor Works at Maker Faire, and I'm standing next to Henry. Henry, thank you very much for talking to us. Thank you. Now, what is eMotor Works? Basically, we provide a lot of different solutions for, for people who want to convert the car themselves, as well as we provide the car conversions. Why would someone convert a car? Why would you take a car that was originally gas, diesel, and turn it into an electric car rather than buy that Volt, that leaf off the line? There are many reasons, actually. Well, one of the reasons is that you prolong the life of your car. So you convert an old car, for example, this, this BMW, it's, an, it's old. The engine was starting to choke. It's, you know, it's about the end of its right, life. Right, so we right. give it a new life. It's, it's a beautiful car. It's a 300 horsepower car. Plus, it's electric, it saves, uh, it saves you on gas, it's, it's green, it's good for the environment, and, um, you know, it's, it's a fun car to drive. And it's, and it's an <laughs> ultimate geek project. But right. I got to ask this too, which is, what is the most difficult part about an electronic car conversion? Aside from batteries, what do you really need to make it go? So there are several key components into the conversion. For example, there is a controller that controls the electric motor. There is a charger that charges the battery pack and the batteries, obviously. What you need most of all is the enthusiasm. Yeah. So you got to love doing things yourself. You want, to be, you, want, you want to have passion for the electric cars. Other than that, we are trying to make everything available for, for, for our customers. So if you really want to convert your car, it will take you several months of work in your garage. You have available components. You will just have to bolt them all together and somehow fit it under the hood. I love it. Henry, I want to give you your little plug here. Uh, where should they go to find out more about eMotorWorks, about the services you provide, about the parts, about the components, about the technology? All the information is our, on our website, eMotorWorks.com. 
visit us and you will see various features that we provide, starting from conversion kits all the way to components for electric vehicle industry. Thank you very much for talking to us. Thank you. And of course, if you're going to make it, why not make it bigger? quadcopter. It's cool, it's nice tech, but it's just a level above a toy. They don't have that much lifting capability, so you can't get all that much work done. And for that, you need something like this. We're here at the Drone Dudes Maker Fair, and I'm standing next to Andrew Peterson. Andrew, thank you very much for yep. talking to us. Pleasure. Now, uh, it's hard to believe, but this is really just a big cousin of this. Yeah. But it's also so much more. Tell me a little bit about what you created. Yeah, so this system right here is a octocopter, is what it's called. It's uh, fully gyro stabilized, and we use this system specifically for the motion picture industry. I noticed that you've got a red camera. That's a 4K high definition camera exactly. hanging off the bottom of this thing. Now, it's all carbon fiber. It's beautifully constructed. How much can this carry? So this camera, this, this system right here can carry up to 12 pounds. <laughs> and you're looking at different flight times with, uh, you know, depending on the wind, we're looking at somewhere in the range of 10 minutes at that at that. 10 minutes pounds. of flight time. Yeah. Now, this is a question I've always had, especially with these really expensive units, mm -hmm. and that is, is there some sort of safety precaution that you build into them so that a pilot doesn't accidentally go beyond the limits of his endurance? Does it automatically start landing? Does it automatically start coming back? Totally. In this system, we're flying with the Wukong, the DJI Wukong flight control, and this system provides a ton of great safety features. Not only are we flying this in safe environments, on closed sets, we are implementing return to home auto land functions. So say our transmitter over here loses connection to our main system, it's going to fly right back to where our home position is, where we launched from, and land on its own. There's actually two controls. You really have right. two pilots. You have one person who's controlling the copter. He's, exactly. he's actually flying the unit. And you've got someone else who is flying the camera. Now, why do you go with this uh, this two-pilot system? So there's a lot going on here, and it's a, too much for just one person to handle. So the reason we have those two, as you can see here, when I rotate, the top of this system is completely isolated and separate from the lower half gimbal. So the pilot, which is me in this case, I'm controlling this system, and I'm flying via FPV at times with this forward-facing camera here on the front boom. And then if I spin it around to the back, you can see a downward facing camera. And that's to track people underneath us, subjects underneath us. So between those two, I'm flying FPV. I'm watching all my telemetry on my small HD monitor right here, which is great because this monitor is allowing us to not only see the FPV angles, but also do a picture in picture and allow us to see what the red camera is shooting. And that's just incredible. Andrew, thank you very much thank for talking you. to us. Thank you for showing us this creation. This is Maker Fair. We're at the Drone Dudes, and the future is rising. is an absolutely wonderful place to practice your geekdom, but for some people it can be a little intimidating. With all these talents, all these crafts, all these skills, the young maker might wonder, well, how will I ever do what these people do? That's why we're here at the Crucible at the Maker Fair, and I'm standing next to Mark Watson, who's gonna explain how the Crucible brings hope to the young maker. Mark, thank you very much for talking to us. Yeah, thank you for having me. Now, Mark, I see behind me this wonderful cacophony of fire and metal and glass and pretty much all things wonderful maker. Tell me, why is the Crucible here? What are you offering? We're here to make it easy. <laughs> we're, make, we're here to help everybody get into welding, get into blacksmithing, get into glassworking, 
ceramics. This is a snippet of what we really do over there. What is the maker experience found within people who come to the Crucible? Most people that come to the Crucible really don't know what they want. They have the ability now with our small classes to be able to sample everything. They can try welding, they can try blacksmithing, they can try wood shop, they can try glass. And then, order, then, then they get inspired. Then they realize they can marry all these disciplines together. But I remember my first day there, I didn't know why I wanted to learn to weld. It was really cool. But then I started getting into blacksmithing and marrying welding with blacksmithing, and now I'm making all kinds of crazy stuff. Now take me around the booth here. Tell me all the different disciplines that are on display. Tell me the different things that are being done. Uh, usually we'll have the glass blowing by here. We have, um, we have the flame work by here where we work on very fine, small glass items. Over here, we have blacksmithing. Today we're doing uh, a very fine discipline of blacksmithing. They're making little leaves. Over here, we have casting. We're actually pouring and casting aluminum belt buckles here today. Very, very cool. Over here, we have um, our ceramics department where kids are making all kinds of strange things. Then we have our jewelry department by here where we are using copper to make name tags and pendants and, and what have you. Again, very, very small snippets of what we really do at the Crucible. This is just a very, this is a sampler. Now, of course, the best place for people to experience the Crucible is to come to the Crucible. Right. But uh, in case they want to check up first, where should they go to find out more about your classes, about your facility, about your experience of the Crucible? Um, the first thing, of course, is www.thecrucible.org. Um, Tuesdays and Thursday nights, we do free tours So in the evening. So anybody can come along, and we'll give you the, the passionate view of the Crucible, Tuesdays and Thursdays. Thank you very much for talking to us. Thank, Thank you, for you for, very much for sharing the Crucible with us. Now, you go learn, and then go make. It's August, which means it's time for camping. And if you're camping, it means you're going to have to cook your food in the great outdoors. Now, you could do the old traditional route and start a big old campfire with a couple of logs and some rocks, and then spend hours and hours taking care of it, cooling it down, you know, not leaving any mark on the land. Or you could get this. We're at the BioLite booth at Maker, and uh, well, I'm sitting, no, we're standing next to Erica, who's going to explain how this phenomenal little device can change your camping experience. Erica, tell me a little bit about what this is. Absolutely. So, this is the BioLite wood burning camp stove. It is a portable camping stove that uses sticks, twigs, pine cones, basically anything you're going to find on the camp trail, and then it generates electricity from the heat of its fire. So, what happens is you put sticks and twigs in the top. And then this power module is going to lock into place, and then the heat from that fire is going to head into a thermoelectric generator that creates an electrical output. Now that electricity does two things. One, it powers a small internal fan that's going to force air back into the burn chamber, so you're getting secondary combustion. So you're actually going to see a smokeless fire from your wood fire. And then the surplus electricity heads down onto the side into this USB port where you can do things like charge your phone, your GPS, your LED light, any small devices that really come in handy in the outdoor doors or in an emergency situation. You told me there's a really cool feature here about, uh, well, it cools down the unit at the end of your burn. How does that work? So yeah, exactly. So we, again, we've designed this to be as fun, but also as safe and efficient of, a, of an experience as possible. So we've got some smart logic built into the power module where it will sense the core temperature of the burn chamber. So if it's too hot, that fan is not going to turn off. So let's say that you're feeling a little impatient. You're like, oh, I'm done with this. And you turn the fan off and walk away. That smart logic is going to say, no, 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 no. It's, too, it's still too hot. And it's going to turn itself back on. And that fan's going to turn back on and burn all of the embers and all of the small flames down to complete cold ash, and then that's when it'll turn itself off. Now, one of the other really cool things about this is that you have designed it to be portable. This actually fits into itself, so it makes the entire unit carryable in this little sack. Yep. Now, this is not the only thing that you've designed. I mean, you could cook right on the top of the stove, but you've also added at this fair, 
this grill. Tell me a little bit about this. Yeah, so this is our, our new pride and joy. This is our new BioLite portable grill. It just launched back in February, and it's uh, designed to bring grilling into the backcountry. So you uh, folds up into itself like this. These little legs pop up just like this. Um, you can see what it looks like with its travel cover. So let's say that you don't want to clean it right away. You can just throw this plastic travel cover and throw it in your pack and you're good to go. Um, and it weighs about 1.8 pounds, so you're looking at a really light load to be able to bring grilling into the outdoors or into the back country. Uh, and then it sits right on top of the stove right here. And what's really cool about it is that we've designed it so that you've got this lid that flips open that gives you direct access to the burn chamber so you can constantly refuel the fire While without you're disrupting your cooking right. surface. So you don't have to take the whole grill off. Exactly. In order to you're refuel. good to go. You're good to go. And so then you do that and then you just close the lid like that. The flames will come up through the flame spreader and you get this awesome grilling surface. What I like about this is this, well, it kind of captures the spirit of Maker. It's geeky, it's innovative, it's super portable, it's super light. You could be using it to live off the grid, and at the same time, unlike so many things at Maker, people can actually buy this right now. Yes. So let me give you some plug time. Tell me how they get these things and how much they cost. Yes, absolutely. So our um, BioLite portable grill and our BioLite cam stove is on sale at our website, which is BioLightStove.com. Um, it's a great website because you can go in and not only see our products that are for sale, but you can also see the amazing work that we're doing with our home stove, which is a larger version cooking stove that we're using in developing communities to help reduce the um, 4 million annual de deaths related to indoor air pollution. Wow. So it's a uh, tech with a conscious. Exactly. Erica, thank you very much for talking to us. Uh, you need to check this out. We're definitely going to try to get this on uh, before you buy or one of the other Twitch shows because it's too cool to pass up. It's the BioLite stove. It's eco-friendly. It's techno-cool. It's portable. Hey, it's Maker. <laughs> I love powerful vehicles, especially when they're powerful electric vehicles. That's why I'm here at Switch Vehicles to talk to Jim, who's going to tell us all about this new, well, I'm going to call it a project motorbike. Is, is that accurate? Well, the, the class, it, it's in the motorcycle class, even though it's got car-like features, but it's got three wheels and it's very light. It's around 1,200 pounds. Now, this thing is actually a kit, right? You could, you could buy this and assemble it yourself if you really wanted to learn about all the parts that it takes to put together a vehicle of this class. Yeah, in fact, all of the ones we've sold so far have been kits that, co that have come with, uh, with a class. It's a 40-hour class, and uh, what we've been doing is, is uh, teaching the teachers that go back to their high schools and bring this project back to it. So we've got, a, uh, we've got a high school in South Carolina and two in Southern California that are using these vehicles to teach electric vehicle design to, to high school students. I like the fact that you're teaching the teachers, and I love the fact that this really does have a kit feel to it. I mean, there are no body panels. You, you make your own. You design it the way that you want it. You customize it. But tell me a little bit about the specs of the vehicle as is. What kind of engine? How much battery range do you have? What have you put into this box? Mm -hmm. Well, this, this machine, um, has a, a, an AC induction motor, um, so it runs on three phase. The battery puts out DC, so it goes through a con uh, an inverter that changes it to AC. And the battery is sitting up front. It's a 10 kilowatt hour lithium um, manganese chemistry battery. And um, so that's a pretty powerful setup. This is a pretty powerful machine. Okay, let's get down to brass tacks. If I wanted to get this kit, if I, if I wanted to assemble it, a, how much am I going to have to pay? And, and B, what kind of work, how many man hours am I going to have to put into it to make this a fully functional vehicle, at least in this form, and then how many more hours to customize? The, the curriculum and the vehicle and all the parts is in the $20,000 range. It's very easy to build from a manufacturing standpoint. It, it uses, it's all steel, it uses conventional um, Manu or you know like fabrication techniques rather than, than um, specialized tools. There's not many specialized tools. So this could be built in, in, um, in countries that don't have a domestic auto manufacturing 
Now, if they wanted to find out more about switch vehicles, if they wanted to find out more about this project in particular, where should they go? They should go to our website. It's switchvehicles.com. Jim, Great. thank you very much for talking right, to us. Thank you. Thank Probably. you for sharing your vision for uh, vehicles of the future. And uh, you know what? If you want to play with one of these, you got to come to Maker because, hey, who makes it better? If you're going to be an electronics maker, you got to start somewhere. Like perhaps assembling a pre-made kit, something that just blinks its eyes at you, like the Maker Robot does here at the Radio Shack tent. I'm standing next to Lauren, who's going to explain to us what Radio Shack's doing at Maker Fair. Lauren, thank you very much for talking to us. Sure, thank you. Now, you've got this, well, just very nice tent that's attracting a lot of attention. Exactly what are you doing in here? So today we're going to be teaching people how to learn to solder, and some of them are experienced, and some are learning for the very first time. I, uh, I fit into that latter category, so tell me what I'm doing. I've got all these components on the floor here. Uh, I've, I've got a couple of lights, I've got some batteries, battery holders, a couple of pins. What's my first step? So our first step essentially is to provide a contact po uh, point for the battery pad. Mm -hmm. So that on the last step when we insert the battery, it has a touch point and completes the circuit. Okay. So as I'm doing this, I'm following your instructions and creating a little battery pad. Maybe you could tell me more about Radio Shack. Radio Shack goes way, way back. I remember when I was first learning electronics, Radio Shack was the place where I went when I needed that hard to find part or that piece that you just wouldn't be able to buy anywhere. Right. Well, what has Radio Shack evolved into now? So, you know, a lot of the makers in this movement have a nostalgic background like yourself for Radio Shack. And they feel like in the past 10 years, we've kind of shied away from that um, area of the business. But that's not the case. It's still there. It's still a part of Radio Shack's DNA. So over the past couple of years, we've really made an effort to get to know this community, um, get more involved in what they do. And Learn to Solder was just the lo most logical step for us to participate at, a, at an event like Maker Faire. What I love about Learn to Solder is it is, that, it is that primary step. If people want to know how to build their own electronics, this is what they have to learn first. And looking around this tent, it's just filled with, well, let's be honest, young people. These, these are the next generation of makers. Uh, what does that make you feel like when you realize these kids, this future generation of makers, is all going to start with Radio Shack? That makes me personally very excited. Um, what's been great about me being able to work here at the Learn to Solder 10 is to see the smiles on the kids' faces when they complete the project, saying, oh my goodness, I did this. I built a blinky-eyed LED robot. <laughs> now, this is the blinky-eyed robot this year, but where will we be going next year? I mean, I'm assuming that Radio Shack's going to want to keep up its sponsorship of Maker Fair. I'm assuming that you're going to come back year after year after year. What are you going to do for that increasingly older generation of, of makers as they get more sophisticated? So we are participating in that right now. We have a great assortment within our stores that we carry and we are, have had Arduino in our assortment now for a year and a half, um, catering to that slightly more experienced, more program oriented maker. Um, and we are working on new projects. We have a great partnership that we just announced here at Maker Fair with Make. Um, and we're very excited to extend that partnership and really build um, a touch point with Make Magazine in the Maker community. Lauren, thank you very much for talking to us. Thank and, you so much for having me. And thank you for supporting a brand new generation of makers. I'm Father Robert, and this is Radio Shack. This is Cheaper, and I'm at Maker Fair. Put something. <laughs> Ah! Oh, that was good. Oh, that was good. <laughs>
watching our coverage of Maker Faire 2013. I'm Father Robert Ballas here, the Digital Jesuit, saying goodbye from the greatest show and tell on Earth.